We have part two of my interview with Eric Leeds. You don't want to miss this. Hey everybody, welcome back to Prince's Friend, exploring music through Prince. This is part two of my interview with Eric Leeds, and if you are enjoying yourself here, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little notification bell to make sure that you are up to date on all of the latest Prince's Friend videos. We release new ones every week. All right, I'm excited to jump back into this. Let's go. Very so, cool. Yeah. And what was the, um, how did the process, you know, kind of like... How was the process different like working by yourself versus working with a lot of other acts versus working with Prince? Like, was there anything unique in each of the different experiences? Well, obviously working, you know, working basically, you know, on my own project, it's just like, okay, I'm the one that decides everything. You know, this is, this is my music. So basically it's, it's, um, you know, Prince's involvement was the most important involvement. He gave me the budget, and the right? Money, you know, the money said, <laughs> Here, you're signed. Here's a whole bunch. And you know, the irony was because I was involved with Prince, Prince gave me a budget for those albums. That was a lot more than what I would have normally received from just a jazz label. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because Prince probably didn't realize how tiny the real market is for the kind of music that I do. And I would I didn't want to tell him that, you know, an album, even a successful <laughs> jazz album like this really doesn't sell a lot, you know, because Prince was really said, hey, man, here. And I yeah. say, really? You, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to give me a rock and roll budget to do a jazz album. Cool. You know. You know, it was absolutely a wonderful situation. But um, I had a, you know, for the second album, this what someone called Things Left Unsaid, I had a producer from New York who was an extremely um, accomplished jazz arranger and musician. His name was Gil Goldstein. You know, I would say to anybody, if you have a producer that really has your back and really kind of understands where you're going, it, it really is, is such a benefit to have somebody else that, that you have to kind of answer to and bounce ideas off of oh, yeah. the wonderful thing. The wonderful thing was, is that, that Gil Goldstein is hooked up in New York with some of the greatest musicians, many musicians who were heroes of mine, who I'm now able to say, wow, you can get this guy to play on my record. Cool. You know, so to be able to build those relationships with people like that was, um, was just an absolutely wonderful experience and, and be able to then say, Hey, you know, this is my music. You know, to be able to have these kinds of players play on my music is, 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 is was just a wonderful opportunity. The, that is the wonderful thing uh, of the relationship that I have with Paul Peterson. It, and, and besides, you know, having had the the, the um, op, you know the ability to record my own music, but the relationships with other musicians that I met through Prince, Sheila yeah. E. being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but Paul, over the years, has become probably my closest musical buddy. <laughs> um, obviously, because of our work with F Deluxe, along with Susanna Melvoin, who is yeah. is absolutely also one of the most wonderful musicians I've I've known. Um, but with our group LP Music, um, which is you know kind of an an extension of of what I would be doing um, if I I were just doing it on my own. But the right. wonderful thing of working with Paul is that um, to have just another voice. And another perspective on things, first of all, makes it much more enjoyable to me because it's, it's, it's much more enjoyable to work with somebody like that yes. than it is to just completely be in it on, on my own. You know, I could thank Prince as much as anything. Hey, you interested me, Paul Peterson and Sheila E and Susanna and all those folks. <laughs> Thanks more than anything. Yeah. Because to be absolutely honest, you know, the music that I do with these people, that's the music that I have an emotional stake in. because. Right. It's, my music, you know, Sheila and I had a band together in the mid '90s called the E Train. That was a that was a hardcore Latin jazz funk thing, and we only had together for uh, about a year and a half or so, a couple of years, and that was absolutely one of the hippest bands I ever played in. I mean, the band was just ridiculous. Uh, the keyboard player in that band was Hernando Neto, who of course went on to play keys with Prince exactly. years yeah. later. So I had I had known Hernando for years before he had even played with Prince. And and when I heard that Hernando was playing with Prince, I laughed and I said, oh, Prince doesn't know what he got. He got a <laughs> keyboard player and a half. Because <laughs> Hernando is just ridiculous. 
the, the ancillary benefits of working with Prince meant as much to me, you know, going forward is even just the experience of working with Prince himself. Kind of, kind of backtracking a little bit back to F Deluxe, because mm -hmm. because sure. F Deluxe is uh, I've been jamming out to a lot of F Deluxe recently, mm -hmm. uh, and and I've definitely enjoyed because uh, you can hear the music like it, it it's. It's kind of like the family, but it's really not because it's you guys. It's not it, it, Prince exactly. with you guys playing it. It's you guys. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so it is yeah. very different. Um, there was one particular song that I got to I got to interview Jelly Bean, mm -hmm. and I asked him about it, and he's just like, "You're gonna have to ask Eric because I uh, <laughs> I don't know." But there was a there was a cover. It was on AM radio, mm -hmm. and um, it was there was a cover of "Come Together" that oh, you guys yeah, did, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, and I've heard millions of versions of Come Together. Everybody mm -hmm. in their mom's band has, you know, a cover of Come Together. But yeah. when I was listening to the one from uh, F Deluxe, like mm -hmm. it was first off, it was it was really good. You know, St. Paul went ahead and brought in, you know, the Minneapolis kind of funk sound to it. And yep. then when it was going, I started hearing a flute and mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute did they just add a flute to come together because and, and what it did it was it just made it like the most unique version of that song oh well, thank you man uh thank you. like ever so i was i kind of wanted to get any feet i know it's been a few years since you did that mm -hmm. song but like can you give me a little bit about your creative process and what you would add to a track like that well, it's funny you mentioned that track because, as you said, everybody in their grandmother has covered that song, which is the reason why I told Paul when he came to me, I said, Paul, doing the Beatles song is great, but come together because it was basically like, like, yo, dude, everybody has covered that. Exactly. What the hell can we do with it? That's going to be anything that hasn't already been done with it. Well, Paul, you know, now in the situation like that, it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to overrule Paul in that, you know, because he said, no, this is the one that I really feel that I want. I said, cool. To be honest with you, I don't remember this specific process by which we came to a decision. And it could have been Paul. It might have been Paul that said to me, hey, well, I hear a flute on this. You know, I, I really don't even remember. But but if 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 you're sitting there saying that that's what distinguishes it, well then I guess we did our job. Oh, most so, definitely, yeah. yeah. Regardless yeah. of who actually made the decision, it yeah. was a good decision. So. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> and 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 to tell you the truth, you know, I mean, it came out great. So I mean, it's not like I guess said, oh, well, you know, you, you know, it's not cool because it was. Paul Paul did an absolutely wonderful job with it. So also I have to remember that that if I bring an idea for a song, whether it's a cover or something to Paul and Susanna. It has to be something that they can hear themselves singing. Right. You know, I can say, oh, boy, I could hear you guys singing that. And they could sit to me and say, <laughs> uh, Eric, love the song, but I don't think that's me. In which yeah. case, it's OK, cool. And the other way around, because if they bring something to me, they said, here's an instrumental. And I said, dude, that ain't that that, that dog don't hunt. Sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, yeah. Right. Exactly. Like you said, because you have to have that emotional connection to it. For it, it to exactly. And exactly. Yeah. And, and, and the the. Um, the, there's an instrumental on on the gaslight, the Afterlux gaslight mm -hmm. uh, album called, called that that Paul just decided to call Leeds Line. They had already written and done the track for it, mm -hmm. and then they gave it to me and said, "Is this something that you would you, you know?" And I really really dug the track. I said, "Okay, I can have some fun with this." So then I came up with all the all the you, you know the melody and the souls and everything. But when you're working with somebody like Paul and Suzanne, and, you you know we we were way beyond taking anything personally. Yeah. You know, so so it's not like it's a dude, you know, don't waste my time. You know, we laugh about it. It's like, you know, we 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 have a we have an in in joke. It's it's like, you know, if I bring something to Paul and he doesn't dig it, he say, Eric, you're fired. And vice versa. <laughs> so, you know, the thing the thing is is we we've got so much that we can throw out yeah. that we don't have time to obsess over, oh, he didn't like that. You know, okay, on to the next, like screw exactly. that on to the next. So yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah. So how, because we, we've, we've thrown the term jazz around a lot. Is that mm -hmm. how you define kind of yourself as a musician? You kind of define yourself as a jazz musician? Or are you more a gig musician? Or how would you, def or do you define yourself? Um, good, good question. I mean, the, if, if there's any aspirations that I have in music, it, it, it was to play jazz. I mean, I didn't, um, 
you know, the, the, the first music that I was into when I was a kid were basically because my brother, you know, just throwing all this music out to when we were young kids because we, you know, we grew up in the late 50s. So, I mean, we were, we were the first, we were the first rock and roll generation almost. Right. Um, but it was always R&B and black music that we gravitated to. Like when we were kids, we did not listen to Elvis. You know, I, I, I will admit to this day, I understand from, from a, a um, cultural and social situation the essentialness of elvis yeah. but musically i never got elvis <laughs> to me to, you know because i grew up listening to little richard and chuck berry and fats domino and those yeah. guys but ray charles was the guy when i was about eight or nine years old and and my brother and i started listening to ray charles that was the music that just was like you, you know that's what did it for me Okay. And he had uh, he had a horn section in a band at the time that was just absolutely it still is one of the most phenomenal bands in the history of any kind of music. You know, it defines, you know, beyond genres. It's just like this is a band for the ages. And he had a tenor saxophone player by the name of David Newman. His nickname was Fathead. David Fathead. Newman. <laughs> And it was Ray Charles's music. Like, you know, it, it wasn't that I, it, you know, I didn't listen to Ray Charles's music and say, oh, I want to sing. I want to do that. No, it was that horn yeah. that I heard. And as, and, and I'm like, you know, I'm 10, by now I'm like 10 years old or something. And, and I'm saying, gee, I'd, I'd like to try to play. I'd like to try to do that. I had no aspirations or idea that I would pursue music as a career. Right. So it wasn't like that. It was just like, yeah, I think I'll play the saxophone. <laughs> but as time went on, it really wasn't until I was in high school that I finally made a, a final determination that music was something that I was going to actually pursue as a career. But jazz was the reason I wanted to play the saxophone. It was in, because we were already getting in a lot of other jazz, Miles, Cannonball Adderley, John Coltrane, you know, Monk, all these you know icons. But it was that music that I really wanted to play. Yeah. Now, you know, being able to play funk and R and B, that kind of just came with the territory because so much of the vocabulary right. kind of leads over into that. Um, you, you know, the the if, if there's any you know one musician that I could point to and say is probably the most significant as far as the, what he represents as far as my my most basic and significant aspirations as a musician, we Miles Davis. Okay. Yeah, but as a listener of music. James Brown was my prince. Yeah. You know, and and um and having the phenomenal opportunity to have known James Brown since I was 14 years old because of my brother's That's involvement right. with James yeah. and all of that. I grew up with those guys. I grew up around learning I, I used to, you know, I used to hang with this band. So I knew Maceo. Wow. From when I was a kid. I would sit and I would learn Maceo Parker's solos on James Brown records, note for note, mm -hmm. you know, because I loved R and B and funk at that time. And said, so, well, as much as, you know, when you're young, it's like, yeah, I'll play that too. You know, yeah, and a lot of, yeah. a lot of the gigs that I, I played were, were funk and R and B gigs along with, with hardcore jazz. So, you know, I had an incredible jazz community at that time. So, yeah. I mean, I, I had absolutely wonderful, wonderful, musicians that were mentors i mean you know some people you know will say well do you consider prince to have been a mentor of, of yours and and really really not right. um for my situation when i came into prince's band i i was older than all of the other people in this band by as much as 10 years i was one of the first people to come into prince's thing mm -hmm. that came from the outside yeah i didn't come up you know, all the, you know, the members of the revolution, Bobby Z and Matt Fink and Mark Brown and Wendy and Lisa, their careers in music really began with Prince. With Prince. Like I say, yeah. I already out there, you know, playing, you know, jazz and R&B and classical music, or whatever, for like 10, 15 years before that. So um, I was the first guy that kind of came in from the outside. So my mentors were the guys that I, you know, the teachers that I studied with in, in music school. Yeah. And the jazz players that I studied with. Well, um, and, and honestly, it sounds it sounds like a lot of your mentors were the same mentors that Prince had. Yeah. You know, James well, Brown, Maceo Parker, the same exactly. people. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, look, obviously, 
Prince knowing that I had a background mm -hmm. and, and a vernacular and a vocabulary on that side of things coming from my experience. Now, although I had never played with James Brown's band, I there, there were a couple of occasions during the 70s where I actually was very close to going out with James for on a couple of occasions. And then and it just didn't, you know, logistically and 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 yeah. my involvement with other things prevented from happening. But he knowing that I came from that mm -hmm. as far as like my background certainly helped me. On the day that I met Prince, everything that I knew how to do as a tenor saxophone player in the context of that kind of music, mm -hmm. I had already been doing. Right. You know, the first recordings that I did with Prince were the song, some of the songs from the family album. Mm -hmm. First day, I mean, literally we shook hands and five minutes later we were, we were at it. Right. And I remember that, that first, that first recording session, we did high fashion mutiny song that was called on the album called Susanna's pajamas. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, desire. Those are the first, first four songs we did in that session. I can listen to the saxophone solos that I play in Mutiny and High Fashion. And I just shake my head and I said, oh my God, it's like, it's, 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 it's as if David Fathead Newman had played this song. <laughs> because that was my, you know, so much of my vocabulary yeah. comes from him and Maceo Parker. And there was, a, there was another tenor saxophone during the 70s named King Curtis. Um, he, he died in the early 70s. He was like the equivalent, you know, during during the 80s, from like the mid 70s through the 80s. If you heard a, um, a popular or well-known R&B or pop song and it had a saxophone solo on it, 90% of the time it was David Sanborn. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, Sanborn was like the go-to guy then. <laughs> well, King Curtis was a tenor player back in the 70s or in the 60s. He played on all so many R&B and pop songs that needed saxophone solos. Yeah. And he was an absolutely phenomenal player. So, you know, so much of my vocabulary on, on, on the R and B side comes from those guys. But at the same time, the jazz vocabulary from Coltrane, from Wayne Shorter, from, you know, Joe Henderson, from Ferris Sanders, from all of these other guys that were my heroes on the jazz side. Well, that's part of me too. So, you know, it, it sooner or later, it's all going to come out, I guess. Yes. But fun time, uh, mm -hmm. this is going to be a fun question. Uh, the three biggest, you know, saxophone players that Prince had was mm -hmm. um, you, the great Eric Leeds, um, Maceo Parker, obviously, mm -hmm. and then there was mm -hmm. uh, Candy Dulfer. Mm -hmm. So uh, you versus Maceo versus Candy, who wins? Oh, um, it's not for me to say because that's for the, for, for the fans to say. They can argue about that. But I'll, te <laughs> I'll tell you this. This is This is... I learned that Maceo was playing with Prince. Mm -hmm. Starting, this was what, around 2002 or somewhere around there. I hadn't seen Prince in probably six or seven years because we kind of went our own way in, in around old mid to late nineties. I was, you know, we were pretty much done with each other. We're, right. we're, it wasn't, you know, there, you know, it was on. I was into my own thing, <clears throat> and I was, I was playing in a Latin jazz band for off and on for several years here in Minneapolis. Um, Stokely Williams was our drummer um, in that. Okay. Um, and we were playing the club here um, in town um, and Prince came by the club. And like I said, I hadn't seen Prince in probably five or six years, but Maceo had been playing with him for maybe six six months or so by then. And and I, you know, so I said, oh, good to see you, how, how you been, whatever, just small talk. And I laughed and I said, Prince, you finally got the saxophone player you should have probably gotten from day one. <laughs> and I meant that. Yeah. Because when he hired me, whether it was for the family or whatever, Prince could have very easily then have said, you know, I'm thinking of using a saxophone on this music of mine that I'm doing for this group. I think I'll call David Sanborn. Just yeah. have him come in and do some solos. Mm -hmm. Or... I'll call Maceo. You know, put, put it this way. If I had not been involved in the family album, the music, there was music on that album that I, I really liked. It was really my favorite Prince album at that mm -hmm. point. Not, not because I was involved in it, but, but I just loved the songs that he wrote for that album. Yeah. Um, if I'm who I am, but I'm not in that band and I'm hearing this music and I'm hearing a saxophone and I'm hearing, oh, that's Sanborn. Or I'm hearing, oh my God, that's Maceo. Yeah. Then I'm going to go buy that record because they're on it. Yeah. Now, 
to my bet to my benefit and my good fortune is that at that time prince was intimidated by guys like that really yes because they were guys that were doing their own thing you know and they were already known entities right. and prince was prince was young then mm -hmm. and he he was not somebody that was going to be comfortable with bringing in a Maceo Parker and sitting there and trying to tell Maceo what to do. Right. You know, right. Outside of Pittsburgh. I mean, I had a reputation in Pittsburgh, but outside of that, no one knew who the hell I was, <laughs> you know? So I'm a known, you know, I'm an unknown entity. At least I have in a style of my own and a sound that's my own mm -hmm. that worked within the context of his music. So it was my good fortune that he was in a place where he wasn't really looking for something that was a known entity. Now, yeah. musically and creatively, on the other hand, that's a good thing too, because Prince was always wanting to be unique. Right. And I think he realized that, yeah, he could get a great known saxophone player, but that's a known sound that's now in his music. And he wasn't looking for that. Right. So I was at the right place at the right time with fortunately the ability to give him something that he could sink his teeth into and yeah. hang his hat on. But it was always funny to me because as the years would go by, Prince would occasionally come to me and, and Matt Bliston and say, what if we added, expanded the section? And I would always laugh and say, cool, let me call Maceo Parker and Fred Wesley. That would be a hell of a section. And Prince then, back then would say, oh no, don't call them, they're too old. <laughs> you know that was but that was yeah. just his cover because he did not want to go down that route so years later when he finally got macy on the band i thought that was so i said that's great yeah. i said he fi he finally got over his reservations about having that because there they had another saxophone player that i could imagine that should play with prince than, yeah. than maceo shortly after that i i did a handful of gigs with with prince in 2002 went to europe mm -hmm. with him um and in in japan for a week and a half and i was not a member of the band i was just coming in to just be a fly in the wall throw in my thing for a minute yeah but when we we did these gigs in japan the horn section on on those gigs was myself maceo and greg boyer of course on, on trombone who was actually the section leader i mean he was the one writing all the arrangements by then oh, and okay. i had known greg i had known greg for years because i knew greg from back from his p-funk days because gotcha. he came out of you know problem with funk so i knew him back so we we all knew each other and that was just one of the most wonderful weeks of playing because playing with maceo and, and and greg we we also around that same time we did we did the tonight show with jay when jay leno still had it mm -hmm. and we did a call and i i can't even remember the name of the song that we did um but but it was the three of us i think sheila was on that gig with us also um playing percussion okay. anyway the, the 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 clip of that is that you know it's been on youtube and it's ended up <laughs> and someone posted the clip of it on facebook this is years ago and i'm, I'm looking at facebook one day just checking and and the clip of this the song we did on the tonight show comes up and there are all the comments you know i'm looking at the, you know comments or whatever and yeah and, and someone <laughs> said someone said oh my god that's the amazing eric leeds i didn't know he was working with prince again now i i don't usually i i don't as a rule i don't get involved in the comments with the things like that i just let that go but i came this close to putting a comment saying thank you very much that's a wonderful kind complimentary thing you said to me thank you very much but looky here you see that little dude standing next to me holding the saxophone I said that's maceo parker the reason you think i'm fantastic has as much to do with maceo parker as anybody else yeah because maceo parker like i say if there was an instruction book you know if you could go to the store and say i need the instruction book on how to play a tenor saxophone in the music that prince makes or pop funk or yeah. whatever the instruction book was written by guys like maceo parker ken curtis fathead newman and some other players back in the day hank crawford and other guys i know how to do what i do because i bought the instruction book <laughs> and i was a really good student yeah maceo wrote the damn instruction book all i do is read from it well so, i think you know. i think too though i 
I, I mean, I, I have my own sound. My I was going to say, sound. I wouldn't take but, away all of the credit from you. You have talent no, of I, your I, own. I got, I got yeah. my own thing. But <laughs> they were the ones, but literally, they were the ones that created the vocabulary. Yeah. You know, you can be, you, you know, uh, you can be an absolutely creative writer. Mm -hmm. But the words you use were were created long ago. Makes sense. That's that's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference. I feel you. No. I feel you on that. Um, though at the same time, I think what because what you were saying before was you know Prince could have brought on the known entity Macy or somebody like that, and mm -hmm. it would have been it would have become yeah. Prince with Macy o. Parker on it, yeah, as yeah. opposed to yeah. you you kind of came in and complemented the sound as opposed to trying to trying to overtake it not even like not that macio would try to overtake right, it yeah no, no I, I get you you see yeah, what i'm saying was, so absolutely and like i say that that was that was the, the benefit that i had like i say being in the right place at the right yeah. because you know it it's it's believe me there are hundreds and hundreds of absolutely wonderful saxophone players that no one had ever heard of that at that period of time could it, you know, had been in the right place at the right time, could have gotten that gig too. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like I say, it, 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 you know, what's the old saying is it's sometimes it's better to be lucky than it is to be good. Yes. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And from, um, I mean, even just from this discussion of you just kind of telling me just kind of how you guys work together, like there was obviously, you know, a mutual respect there. Uh, well, I, between, I, I, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, just, it feels like there was. Well, I think that's all of my questions, Eric. Uh, what I want to first do is I want to say thank you so much for coming uh, and being on Princess Friend. It's been a blast getting to just uh, not only to hear your stories about your time with Prince, but also just about you and about everything else that's kind of going on. Oh, well, man, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. I mean, Definitely. And for anybody who wants to check out your stuff, I, tell, us, tell us again about the LP Music gig that you have coming up but um yeah. just tell us any any ways that we can follow you on social media websites anything like that as well absolutely absolutely um i mean first of all for people that know uh, paul peterson my closest musical buddy for years now uh and i have this band called lp music um the, the name is kind of a play on the words also llp means leads peterson but it also means long plane Yes. Just a throwback to when we used to actually make records, vinyl <laughs> records. And, you know, and, and when we start, we, we, we play long. So <laughs> that's a, um, we are playing at a club called the Ice House in Minneapolis uh, on Friday, April 26th. Um, it is in the midst of the Prince Celebration weekend. Uh, for those of you that night who will be at the Armory, uh, enjoying the event there with Prince on the big screen and the and the, and the performers playing along with that, um, that gig should be over probably around 10, 10, 15, 10, 30. Um, the club we're playing, the Ice House, is very close to downtown, maybe about 10 minutes away. We're going to be your after party because we're not going to hit until 11, 11, 15. And um, we'll wait for some stragglers too. So, you know. <laughs> Uh, the Ice House is a really cool place. It's good food. Come in and, and hang. Um, the band, we, we, our band is just killing. I have to commend you because when I was doing my video of the, you know, here's all of the fun events, not all, but as many as I could find, you mm -hmm. know, that are going on during Celebration Week, yours was pretty much the only one that I found who had the nerve and the bravery to be on that Friday night uh, opposite, you know, I know you're coming on after the show, but like, you're like, no, 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 we're not scared. We're not, we're not going to be scared of, of Prince on the big screen, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but, but yeah, but I mean, it's definitely, definitely we're timing it. So it's, you know, Oh yeah. Most of that. But, but there are so many, like there's, barely anything else happening that night which is yeah. crazy well um, it's actually it, it worked for us you know we just you know we looked at it and they said what's what's a good tonight doing we said we'll look at everything that's going on so well, let's tail it on that and and it, yeah. it logistically works it out because because obviously you, you know we we want to make it as easy for as many people to come <laughs> to you as so. most definitely very cool well hopefully everybody will go check you out uh, yep. at the Ice House uh, mm -hmm. Celebration Week on that Friday, the 26th. And I'll put the links down in the description as well, so for easy access for everybody listening.
Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for coming and being on the show, Eric. Awesome. It's been a blast. And I am so thankful that you took the time out of your day to come and talk with us. My, my pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Eric for coming and being a guest on Prince's Friend one more time. And thank you for watching. If you did like that, don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Obviously, we have the Patreon drive going on right now, so if you want to help support the channel for as little as $2 a month, don't hesitate to go to patreon.com slash princessfriend. It helps out the channel a lot and keeps us growing. With all of that said, thank you for coming and watching. May you live to see the dawn. See you in the next video.